Thanks, everybody. I think we're ready. I think we're all set up and ready to go. Is, is this guy working okay? Yeah. Um, it, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Pierre Vittorio Arelli tonight to, uh, to lecture at the A. Am I right, Pierre? This is a first lecture at the A. It's not often I get to say that, say that you know, in, in welcoming somebody, that it's an opportunity for a first lecture here. It is for Pierre, and, and I think it's great to be able to do this now. Um, I had the, the pleasure to, to come across Pierre Vittorio uh, for the first time a few years ago when I was teaching at the Berlaga. Uh, I was invited by Pierre's uh, thesis advisor on a final project he did at, at the Berlaga, uh, his advisor, um, Ilya Zingelis, and, and I think Pierre was probably one of Ilya's final students at the school and is, of course, uh, um, one of the great teachers of architecture in the 20th century. In fact, a tutor that shaped what we all know of as the diploma school here at this place a very long time ago and had the ability to work across incredibly diverse ranges of ideas and, and in fact teaching partners within the unit. Um, P Pierre is very much um, a product of the kind of culture of architecture that Elia has always demonstrated within his teaching. Um, I was invited to come in and see a project that, Il that, uh, that Pierre Vittorio worked on for a year that was really a, a remarkably unique European deconstruction of a European city. Um, uh, the city of Brussels, which he knows very well, in which he went through an analysis of, of the built mass and material of the city as the basis for a research project that just really stood out within particularly the context of that institution. Um, Pierre Vittorio's interest in the city and urbanism, um, which is quite deeply formed in his own approach to architecture, will form a backdrop for what he's going to be presenting tonight. And it's very much an interest that, that uh, encouraged me to invite Pierre Vittorio to come over this term to teach a history and theory studies course here at the AA. One of, one of Pierre Vittorio's deep interests is, lies not just in urbanism, but in this very peculiar generational reality of urbanism today, which is that it's a category of thinking that's almost fully untheorized or unproblematized in contemporary architectural discourses. I think one of the strange realities of contemporary architecture is that the issues of urbanism no longer play the kind of foundational role in the forming of architectural thinking and careers that they did for people a generation ago. When people like Venturi or Colin Rowe or Coolhaus write books on urban conditions that in effect form the basis for architectural careers. Those kind of three seminal texts from the 70s close for a generation the idea of urbanism as a topic that can be, in, in the words that Pierre Vittorio sometimes uses, proactively theorized and not retroact famously retroactively theorized in, in the thinking of someone like Coolhouse. That's where Pierre Vittorio's interest lies today, as a kind of proactive rethinking of the city and urbanism. His talk tonight on the diagram sits with that as a kind of backdrop. It's, a, it's the title for a lecture that I've been waiting for for a few years, after the diagram. Um, and it's a title that we've played with as the basis for courses here in the last few years. Pierre Vittorio beat us to it, and I think it's absolutely great. Um, that topic, that title comes obviously after a decade of sustained thinking, questioning, and arguing about the status of the diagram around the world in architectural discourses, and obviously many people here, many units, many programs here have worked through the issues of the diagram, architecture, and urbanism in different ways. Um, before studying a master's degree at, at the Berlaga Institute, Pierre Vittorio um, studied architecture at the Institute for Architecture and Studies in Venice in Italy. Um, after that, he went to the Berlaga where he received his master's degree in architecture and where he now teaches. He directs the second year uh, research unit there and also teaches uh, a studio or a unit at the school. He's um, this term uh, a guest professor at the Academia Madricio. Uh, and also teaches at Delft University, and as of about a week and a half ago, has completed his PhD on architecture. I think the first of the graduates of the PhD program at the Berlaga, where he was grilled by people like Peter Eisenman and others who are deeply interested and engaged with the kind of topics that he's dealing with. It's a pleasure to welcome Pierre Vittorio Arelli. Thank you, Brett, for this um, overwhelming introduction. <coughs> Actually, I want to a little bit apologize because the talk of tonight will be a little bit, if you want, idiosyncratic and also a bit personal, um, um, which 
come from, if you want, uh, an accident of my life, which was to be almost, I would say, forced to go to study in the Netherlands when I finished my, actually, my, my graduate studies in, uh, in Venice. I mean, my idea was to do something completely different, was to, to become a historian. But uh, my mentor, my teacher, almost said, well, you, you, you really have to go to the Netherlands. You really have to get out from, from Venice and, and, and really somehow embrace uh, what is uh, today, actually, the contemporary condition of, uh, of practicing architecture and architectural theory, which was the thing I was very, very interested. And uh, uh, when, when one comes to the Netherlands, I mean, uh, one have an impression to be almost uh, in my own city, in Rome, in the 16th century, well, all artists were, were going there to, to really uh, face what actually was the, the ground zero of, uh, of newness. And if you, uh, when you are in, 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 in Rotterdam, you really have that feeling. I mean, there are people from all over the world really almost waiting uh, a, a magic recipe to, to improve uh, their own practice, their own kind of architectural intelligence. And when one studies there and, and teach there, and I have, to, I have to say I really enjoy to, to, to live there for, for f I mean, I'm still living there for a few years, one somehow have to accept certain codes, certain paradigms, a certain way of thinking about architecture and architectural theory. And to me, this was quite somehow uh, uh, kind of a, a new language. I mean, something that's when I was uh, studying in Venice was completely unknown. I mean, the language of what we call today research, which of course have a very, very specific meaning, and, and this specificity is quite uh, recent. If one wants to summarize, um, actually, the, in one word, how this what we call research is, is actually represented. Uh, this word is diagrams. And of course, for many of you, uh, this word is nothing new, is nothing really uh, shocking. But for me, who was actually, who used to think about architecture in terms of plans, sections, uh, and uh, actually uh, 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 models or classing, uh, let's say, traditional means of representation, the encounter with the diagram was really like the encounter with a new language which actually uh, um, uh, forced me to be skeptical about it. Uh, I, I really want to be agree with you on the meaning of the word skepticism. I mean, skepticism is not just to, to refuse uh, complete to believe in something, but skepticism means that you, of course, you acknowledge the importance of a certain, uh, certain language, but at the same time, because your background, you're almost forced to to analytically be detached from this, uh, from, from this uh, language. Now, uh, Wittgenstein uh, once said that uh, language, I mean, at the end of his career, I mean, he, he, he w as you know, his, his philosophy was completely devoted to the problem of language as, as actually cognition of reality. And at the end of, hi of his career, um, he almost suggested that language was a, a camouflage of reality. And, uh, uh, well, my arguments, and especially, uh, let's say, I. I as I told you, this is a very personal argument. It, it comes from my also activity of teaching. And uh, my argument is that often I see diagrams not only as a, as a representation of reality or as a camouflage of reality, but really as a, a form of nihilism. Uh, a, a nihilism uh, in, in a literal sense, as a kind of, uh, uh, if you want, a deliberate uh, consumption of reality as reality appears around us. Now, I want to uh, say that uh, uh, I don't want to uh, give a kind of, uh, if you want, romantic or negative uh, connotation to the word nihilism. I mean, we have to think nihilism not in a nihilistic uh, way, if you want. Uh, I mean, I really would like to, to, to really focus this word in a very structural sense. I mean, something that is really implicit, uh, if you want, in, in really how Western thought, uh, uh, in a way, uh, theorize, how Western thought project. I mean, in this kind of moment of, of, of projection, a moment of creation, of, of becoming, uh, this idea of, of, of reducing reality as appears, I mean, empirical reality in, into nothing, I mean, to really somehow overcome reality. As, it's, it's a very structural aspect of our uh, way of thinking. Nevertheless, of course, as all structural aspects of our, let's say, uh, 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 practice towards reality is also uh, very uh, problematic. Now, I would like to uh, somehow uh, criticize this I would like to offer you uh, a kind of point of view on this uh, argument uh, that diagrams somehow symbolize this, this incredible energy of consumption of reality, representation of reality, consumption of reality, and of course also problematic uh, somehow detaching ourselves from, from reality. 
But somehow, for me, it's an excuse to focus on certain structural way of thinking of our age uh, that find in the locus of architecture a very, very crucial representation. That's why I think today architecture, even beyond itself, is a very important discipline. Because in a way, in its own construction, its own theoretical construction really implies a certain uh, vision of the world. And actually, it's very interesting that the word theory uh, means really vision. I mean, theory means really the representation of a clear, precise point of view. So the first context in which we have to see uh, diagrams is postmodernism. When I talk to my students about postmodernism, of course, they immediately said, uh, they immediately refers to Charles Jenks, the language of postmodern architecture, 1977, uh, where Jenks actually uh, almost, uh, I would say, uh, 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 summarized, categorized uh, the idea of postmodernism, especially referring to, uh, to a style. Somehow he, he consumes something that for me is still uh, very crucial and very present among us in, in an image. And of course, POMO, as, we, uh, art, uh, as architects we used to call postmodernism, is something that ends in a certain, uh, uh, let's say, period of time, and something that actually, as I said, we really associate with, the, with a particular language, with a particular style. And I have to say that the, last, the less interesting way uh, in which one can represent the postmodern condition is, is especially um, architecture. Now, if one wants to really find uh, a representation of postmodern that really goes beyond this kind of, if you want, image, uh, stylistic consumption, uh, for me, the most interesting way to, to find the seeds of, of postmodernism, and uh, postmodernism really as a place where we can, when we can somehow situate a way of thinking reality through, through diagram, is actually uh, literature and, uh, and music. It's very interesting that between the 40s and 50s, there were certain groups, actually, uh, especially two groups, uh, Group 47 from Germany and Group 63 from Italy, who actually were the first groups to, to name themselves neo-avant-garde, uh, a word that st is still used today also within architecture to define the, the seg, let's say, the, the, gen the, the generation, the avant-garde generation that came in, uh, to, to the scene in the 60s. Uh, these groups uh, actually were uh, very much uh, uh, linked together uh, by a certain consciousness that one of the most important keywords of their own time was the idea of change. Uh, the idea of change uh, was for them actually the, the pure, let's say, the, the, the Weltanschauung through which we're uh, considering a, a possible representation of the world. But change for them was a pure mechanism. Change was absolutely liberated from any theological way of thinking about uh, reality. So if in modernity, or what we used to call modernity, change was a, a proactive act of reformation of reality, a kind of theological way of thinking about reality. Theological in this place means that you are aiming to something uh, that is there, that have a goal. And for this generation of people, for the generation of the neo-avant-garde, change was, an, as it was a pure mechanism, was actually liberated from this kind of uh, uh, condition. Uh, two, uh, one, two leaders of these uh, groups are well-known intellectuals. One is uh, Heinrich Boll from a group 47 and Umberto Eco from group 63. And actually they were really insisting on the idea of change both as a free value becoming, as becoming that doesn't have any more a kind of projection towards which it aims, but is a mechanism in itself. And for them, this was really the foundation of, uh, of what they would call a neo-avant-garde art or neo-avant-garde literature. So actually, Around that time, uh, a, a very important historian of music, Leonard Mayer, 1967, a little bit late, uh, theorized a concept that for me, which actually really uh, framed this uh, problem of change, liber um, uh, becoming, change as becoming liberated from any value. And he theorized this condition as probability of stasis. Now, stasis uh, uh, commonly means something that is stuck, uh, that is stopped. But it's not really a, a correct translation. Stasis uh, have two meanings. One is, of course, a, a, a kind of moment of, of suspension. And suspension is not something totally stuck. Suspension is really something that is so somehow is almost on the verge of, of, of doing, evolving in something else. But at that moment, is somehow in a kind of fluctuating stability. And the other idea is a, a political meaning, if you want. It means rebellion, unity, uh, civil war. Actually, it's very used by. Uh, a Greek historian Thucydides, in his book, uh, The History of Peloponnesian War, 
it really refers to the idea of stasis as a civil war, as something really actually opposed to the idea of polemos, which means uh, the word polemos is where the word polemic comes from. Polemos was really a war between two different discernible parties, while uh, uh, stasis was really an internal war, where it was not, I mean, there was something happening, there was a change happening, but it was very difficult to discern the resolution of the change. I mean, an example of, uh, of stasis is actually really the postmodern war, like, for example, the, the war in Iraq, where there is a kind of something going on with very drastic, uh, let's say, moments of change, but we are not able anymore, uh, I mean, our cognition is not any, uh, able anymore to discern a clear resolution of what's uh, going on. So for Leonard Mayer, this was uh, actually the condition in which uh, the, uh, what he, would, he was calling a new modernity, he, he didn't use the word postmodernity, but he was using the word a new modernity was somehow uh, uh, entering. And uh, uh, he really stated that change, if uh, in modernity change was actually a, a moment of, of transition and reform, a theological reform of reality, for Leonard Meyer change was a fluctuating stasis. So we, we can say that in the last 50 years uh, we have an inc a moment of incredible change of our condition, but somehow this change has been never, I mean, as, as Brett said before, I mean, deeply theorized. I mean, it, the change has not been instrumentalized as, as a really cognitive reform in the way we are thinking about the world. So this change is very always recorded, very much present. We, I mean, you can't, I think, you can't open a book anymore about urbanism and architecture that in the first sentence doesn't say, well, the world in the last 10 years, the last 20 years, the world is enormous, uh, has been changed completely. But this change, I mean, is, is so fast, is so, uh, let's say, strong, that its own kind of uh, uh, cognition ends up in this kind of fluctuating stasis, in something that is uh, always moving, and because it's moving, it's, it's stuck on this kind of, uh, in, in this kind of somehow uh, uh, moments of uh, stasis. Now, um, in a way, uh, to, to say that this is a kind of uh, uh, phenomena of the, of the last 50 years is not actually really entirely correct. Uh, I would say that uh, this condition is something that really starts much time before, uh, precisely at the moment where the idea of becoming, which is actually the essence of change, is somehow progressively liberated from any fundament. And actually this moment uh, is the French Revolution. And I would argue that postmodernism, in a way, started not in the 60s or 50s, but really started with the French Revolution. Now, this is sounds very bizarre, but if you are a, a student of history and you go to a university and you enroll yourself in uh, so, I mean, contemporary history, you will discover that contemporary history actually starts really from French Revolution. And what they call modern history stops with the French Revolution. So the French Revolution is really the transition from modernity to contemporaneity, to something that is after uh, uh, modernity. So the essence of this transition is when becoming, I mean, the idea of change is liberated from the idea of episteme. And if we really want to criticize the essence of diagrams, we really have to uh, pay attention to this definition. I'm really sorry to make this detour, but I think it's really essential to, to, to really understand, let's say, what is behind, actually, the, if you want, pure critique of the diagram in itself. Now, uh, one can say that becoming is actually, I mean, according to its own original definition, which is not a given. I mean, becoming is an invention of Greek thought, which arose for the first time with the invention of metaphysics. So becoming is, in a way, the essence of nihilism. The, the claims that something come out from nothing, and, and therefore, because it's on constituency, can actually return to nothing and again. I mean, actually, this is actually the mechanism, uh, according to Greek thought, that really produce the idea of change, the idea of becoming. I mean, when we project something, in our uh, moment of projection, we produce something, but at the same time, we also consume something. And in this kind of moment, there is an implicit claim that something can be nothing at any moment, can, let's say, be created out of nothing, and can return to nothing uh, uh, as it was coming out of uh, nothing. So this is actually why nihilism is not, is not a bad word. I mean, it's, it's not something that we have to regard as something, uh, uh, let's say, negative, but, well, it's problematic, of course, 
but it's really structurally, uh, let's say, implicit in our way of, of thinking about the world, which actually, as I told you, arose for the first time with the invention of, of, of metaphysics, of something that is really beyond our physical uh, 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 reality. So the word episteme was actually a counteract to this condition. Episteme today is translated commonly as a science, but this translation is not really correct. Uh, episteme, I mean, uh, steme, was actually the, the, uh, the, the decorated uh, crew of the ship. You know, the, 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 the boats have this ship, and there was always a kind of iron steel decoration in front of the, of the, of the ship, which was meant to really break through the waves of the, of the sea. And actually, episteme, mean, I mean, literally, means standing above the waves of becoming. So for Greek thought, in order to really assess this problem of becoming, I mean, this condition of becoming, it was important that there was a kind of uh, permanent truth. There was a kind of a, a clear moment where this, let's say, the, 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 the anxiety of becoming was clashing against this kind of idea of, of episteme. The idea of, I mean, episteme means the will to know permanently the, will, the, the truth of the world. And of course, this was not, it, it was not something uh, coming out of nothing. It was really a reaction to this problem that our way of thinking, our representing was constantly moving and constantly consuming through, through actually uh, creation and becoming the world. And therefore, there was a need of something else, something that was counteracting this kind of uh, uh, phenomenology of, of thought. And this is precisely the idea of, uh, of uh, episteme. Now, with postmodernism, I mean, as, a, as a, I tried to conceptualize it before, we can say that uh, 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 contemporary becoming, actually, is a change liberated from the horizon of episteme. I mean, we, we, I mean, we have only pure change. We don't have any more that kind of, uh, 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 let's say, mental background through which we can really precisely assess change. So change is, uh, is something that, that evolved in its own without any, let's say, background where you can really assess this kind of uh, movement of, uh, of change. And I think this, this condition is uh, beautifully uh, summarized by Nietzsche when he said that the world is an artwork that makes itself. And this, for me, is really the ground zero of postmodern thinking. I mean, something that creates itself without any more this, let's say, kind of external moment of, of, of action, this exter proactive external moment of pushing something in, in one uh, uh, direction. Now, uh, it's very interesting that the moment, uh, actually, uh, we start to represent the world in these terms, uh, new uh, ways uh, of representation of the city uh, start to uh, emerge. And this representation of the city were no longer dealing with form, but were dealing with a new kind of substance, which was uh, not anymore, that was transcending, if you want, the will of the architect, the will of the builder to, 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 to form the city. This is actually really the beginning of what today, with very much, with a lot of nonchalance, we call urban space. Well, urban space, I mean, which is, I mean, empirically speaking, urb, uh, space is actually the distance between two points. But urban space is a, is a new, let's say, cognitive uh, idea of the city, where form actually what you really can, what is doable by our action, is not any more uh, important. Urban space is actually the interaction, a territorial interaction of, of, of different, of different elements, different things, that cannot be defined anymore through uh, form. And this is actually very much almost uh, uh, emerging with inventions such as electromagnetism, where actually there are flows, th there are workings of, let's say, of, of elements such as networks that are not anymore reducible to clear formal representation. Also, the development of modern cartography, where actually the, uh, uh, the seed is not anymore represented in an empirical way through views, but is really represented through a very abstract projection. And of course, cartography has a very long, long history, but it's precisely at the, um, uh, in the between of the 18th century that this really, the city is really scientifically mapped. I mean, where science, uh, and not anymore representation, well, science itself be become a form of representation. And of course, science really uh, constantly updates its own representation of the city. So science something that almost <laughs> substitutes the idea of episteme. I mean, there is not anymore, there are not any more fixed canonical way of representing the city, but with at the advent of mediums such as electricity or electromagnetism or, or cartography, 
Science itself is the new episteme. And science, I mean, one of the mechanisms of science is that science always change. I mean, science is, is not anymore, it's not something that is fixed, like the previous episteme. It's very interesting that today we come, I mean, we actually translate uh, 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 episteme as a science. I mean, as, as you know, Foucault is very clear about that. So, but, but actually, the moment where episteme is something fixed, something that really represents the city in a very, let's say, formal way. And the moment where the seed is constantly represented in its own becoming is exactly at that moment. Now, for me, one of the, actually, this is actually where the diagram enter. I mean, the, the moment where there is a need of new form of representations that are not anymore uh, empirically intelligible, but they are abstraction of this process of, of becoming of the seed itself. Now, for me, one of the most incredible example of this new, if you want, or this epistemological shift uh, is the Nolly map. Uh, perhaps you know this uh, famous uh, map of Rome uh, drawn by Giovanni Battista Nolli in 1748, uh, which actually uh, is always, I mean, there are a lot of architects and, and urbanists that use this map as, a, as an example of a rhetoric about the city. Colin Rove used to say that this was a, a clear representation of figure ground urbanism. But I think that this interpretation, or more, there are more contemporary interpretations that see this as a kind of uh, the, the representation of the difference between public space and private space, although at that time there was not really a definition of public space and, and private space. For me, the, actually, the, the, the real problem of this map, that for the first time, in, in a very scientific manner, I mean, the, the Nolly map is the first scientific mapping of Rome, and actually is one of the most uh, more precise, accurate, scientific mapping in the history of, of cartography. It's very interesting that, that Rome in the 18th century was a, a very, uh, um, uh, not, not anymore such important cities, but if it was important, it was important for one thing, which was actually the development of cartography. I mean, cartography was a very advanced science in, uh, in, in Rome. And what this map shows for the first time is actually the difference between city and architecture. So architecture is represented in its own conventions. I mean, architecture is really drawn as a plan. I mean, all these uh, churches and monuments. While the city is actually abstract as a kind of plan of tarmac. It's a kind of, it becomes a kind of generic, uh, uh, let's say, footprint. Now, for us, this is very obvious. But at that time, if you compare this representation to previous representation of uh, cities and to previous representation of form, this was a really big shock. Because for the first time was breaking, you know, the classic continuity between city and architecture. You know that Leon Battista Alberti used to say that to design a building and to design a city is basically the same thing. I mean, and that kind of way of thinking, that kind of continuity between city and architecture, is really actually what we are still, uh, in a way, having in our background. That's why we invented diagrams to really gap the bridge between these two representations. So for the first time, not only really put in crisis that, that let's say, way of thinking. So for Nolly, uh, architecture was representable through its own form, while uh, the city was this kind of abstract uh, 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 pattern. What is interesting that in order to render this map, he implied two totally different ways of measuring the city. The architecture was really represented through its own repeatable measure, so it was really empirically uh, 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 measure and draw. And actually, what is very interesting is that one of the person who was helping Nolly in mapping the architectural part of the, of the map was Piranesi, the young Giovanni Battista Piranesi. While Nolly was mostly responsible for the black part, Nolly was not an architect. He was a scientist of measures. And he really, I mean, he totally abstracted the city to this kind of uh, diagram, if you want. I mean, what, what could be, uh, let's say, a, a primordial. Uh, diagrammatic representation, which for us uh, looks very obvious, but at that time this kind of overlapping of these two layers was absolutely uh, stunning and, and impressive. Now, it's very interesting that 12 years later, actually not 14 years later, in 1762, uh, Piranesi answered to that challenge. I mean, answered to the challenge of knowledge that were saying, well, uh, the city is not anymore representable through form, through architecture, but only uh, through this kind of new scientific uh, methodology, which actually was represented with this black, black rendering. And not only countered that position with this, this very famous uh, Campo Marzio, his own reconstruction of the imperial city in, the, in, the, in what actually at the time was the center of Rome. Now, 
the Campo Marzio that I think you know very well was introduced by this drawing where Piranesi destroyed the whole city, actually the whole black, if you want, part of, uh, of Nolli, and he only, uh, let's say, left few monuments, which were at the monuments of Ancentrum that was existing at that time. And from this, uh, uh, let's say, archipelago of urban artifacts that are represented in a very empirical way, I mean, no, uh, Piranesi goes back actually to this kind of birth view uh, approach to the city. Uh, uh, so he refused this kind of, uh, uh, in the first instance, this kind of uh, abstraction of Nolli. And then from this kind of conjecture where he really actually materially destroyed the city, I mean, the, the Campo Marzio was not pure fantasy. It was really almost a, a Latin, I mean, a, a project of reconstruction of Rome. Uh, 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 Piranesi hated the Baroque Rome. I mean, the, 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 city, how the city was evolving from, from uh, uh, 16th century to, to 17th century, really was dreaming to reconstruct the city according to the principle of, uh, of the imperial architecture. And from this conjecture, he reconstruct uh, uh, the whole city. But what you can see, uh, actually, this reconstruction was very precise because uh, he was mapping this existing uh, quite precisely, also because he learned that technique, the scientific technique from Nolli. Uh, in this reproduction, you cannot see very well, but there are certain parts which are more dark than others, which were the existing fragments existing at that time. And through this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, archipelago, it was then reconstructing the whole uh, uh, supposed uh, uh, imperial city. And, and what Piranesi is doing is actually trying to represent the whole city only by means of architecture. So he's refusing this kind of abstraction and he's still using the conventions of architecture to represent the city. So this not is it the last, if you want, desperate attempt to still see the city as a product of architecture. I mean, where, where actually uh, the formal accuracy of architecture is able to reconstruct the city. And he ended up in a, actually uh, a city which is made only by architecture where there are not any more streets. I mean, what actually was very, very visible and present in the Nolly map. Now, it's very interesting that uh, this kind of uh, problem of uh, of representation of the city uh, was very much uh, pushing architects who were very much believing also in form, such as Le Corbusier, in considering uh, the diagram as, at the end, the only way of representing uh, uh, the city itself. At the end of the, uh, of, the, of the book of the Radiant City, Le Corbusier said that the truth is in the diagrams, and to place, a th uh, I mean, to, to really see the truth in the diagram that we first see, uh, we, we, we were discussing the idea of truth as, as a kind of something that is fixed. Well, now uh, the truth is identifying something that always changed, that always record in real time. For Le Corbusier was really to place theory back to its own true frame. So th from that moment on, I mean, when actually Archidet recognized that there was a difference as Nolly uh, was representing between seed and architecture, Actually, the diagram, even for Le Corbusier, was very much confident with architectural form. For diagram itself was actually the true frame of theory, of representation of the city through uh, architecture. But, uh, and actually, this is also very, uh, very crucial for all the architects that came after Le Corbusier, who actually, as Le Corbusier, were very interested in representing the city through architecture more and more architectural form was not anymore able to, to actually express uh, this representation and the uh, new definitions and new concepts start to emerge. Like for example, the idea of network, which was for, for the first time really theorized uh, by Konstantinos Doxiadis in 1963 with the, De the Delos uh, paper, where he actually really saw uh, uh, the, the web, he was really using uh, in a very naive way the, the spider web. Uh, Doxiadis was a very interesting person, very naive, but extremely visionary. And I, I have the feeling that he was really the last, I mean, Doxiadis' work was really the last theory about the city. I mean, the last attempt to really uh, put forward uh, something that we are today only basically repeating, maybe with, with more sophisticated way of representation. Nevertheless, for Doxiadis, uh, form was no longer, let's say, something that, or let's say architectural form was no longer able to represent the contemporary world. And so you have the emergence of these new forms of representations that are totally beyond the architecture. But what is very curious that precisely at the time, we are uh, in the 60s, a little bit before in the 50s, the diagram from a means of representation that is beyond architecture, 
that really goes beyond what architecture can represent, in a way feeds back to architecture itself. Now, one of the first moments in, this, in, 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 in which this happened is uh, a bit cover uh, uh, book, uh, Architectural Principle in the Age of Humanism, where he started to say, I mean, he really claimed in the introduction of the book that uh, uh, he tried to describe a Renaissance architecture not through a series of, let's say, uh, episodes, but he's trying to recognize a certain continuity uh, through these episodes that can be represented through what he really called a diagram. Now, this is very important because uh, this book has an enormous influence not only on actually architects such as Peter Eisman, who actually really were somehow very interesting to use this uh, uh, device to actually uh, 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 construct their own architecture, but also to different architects such as the Smithsons. And the Smithsons were very much influenced by the cover book, which was published in 1949. They acknowledged this uh, many times. And actually, I, 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 mean, I think that their use of diagrams really come from uh, the, the, the reading of this book. Because uh, actually, what Wittkover was, I mean, Wittkover was a very, if you want, idealistic person. I mean, he really wants to somehow see in architecture almost the uh, kind of representation of something that was really beyond architecture. And so he's, he's, he's really concerning with diagrams, was really to somehow uh, to not see architecture as a kind of collection of very different separate episodes, but really as a, the construction of a kind of collective cognitive way of thinking about architecture. So, it, so for him, the diagram was really the representation of this. So from, from an instrument that represents the city that is, let's say, uh, beyond architecture, the diagrams, be, let's say, feeds back in, in, in architecture uh, itself. And of course, Conley Rove uh, was very much uh, uh, using that technique. And what, what actually uh, what start to emerge as a way of using the diagram is a kind of cinematic let's say, way of scanning architecture. So with Conley Rove, you don't have anymore just a plan, but you have a series of diagrams, a series of drawings that almost in a cinematic way represent the becoming, the evolution of architectural form. And this, of course, is really the origin of what, how we are practicing diagrams. I mean, with diagrams, we really almost try to get rid of this kind of uniqueness, singularity of one drawing, of one plan, or one section, I mean, or one form. And we transcend that singularity in this kind of attempt to represent the becoming of that form that nevertheless is, is, is fixed. And of course, there were also different ways of using diagram, but still with this kind of idea of, of transcend the fixity of architecture. These are the famous bubble diagrams done by uh, graduate students at Harvard. I always show this to my students because I think this is really the ancestors or, or, of many diagrams uh, people are still doing uh, today, where actually, uh, 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 let's say the, the, the architecture itself become a ghost and what you have is really this kind of uh, mold that is supposed to form architecture which is movement. But what is interesting at a certain point what is supposed to counter the fixity of architecture, movement as is represented in this uh, diagram, become the architecture itself. Uh, if you take for example uh, uh, Peter and Alison Smith's on Berlin Hauptstadt project, uh, which for me is really the first urban project where the diagram become a kind of form, architectural form, you see how the, the, the diagram of ne the network, I mean, what actually uh, the Smithsons were really putting forward as a, as a new palimpsest of, of, of architectural, uh, the architectural, architectural vision of the city is almost frozen. It became really an architecture itself. And in a way, megastructure, <coughs> it's really this. I mean, a megastructure is almost a frozen, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 version of the diagram. I mean, the diagram itself became an artifact. And of course, this for me is very much clear in one of, I think, very crucial project, uh, uh, Tokyo uh, Bay project by Kenzo Tange, where the, the zero degree of its own formal composition is a pure diagram, is a diagram of a plug-in system. I mean, uh, uh, you have the idea of that you have a central core, and then to this core you have this kind of capsule that are plug-in. So the project, I mean, the form of the city itself became an abstraction, became a diagram. What is interesting that, that Tange developed the project within the surface of the sea, really to isolate this project from the rest of the sea. It really shows that how the translation of diagram into architecture was really requiring this new total abstraction, this kind of consumption of, of, of previous form of, uh, of architecture. But, and how somehow uh, this new 
let's say, representation of the city through architecture was able in one sweeping gesture to completely reshape the entire island of Japan. This, the idea of Kantange was really to extend the whole project gradually to the whole island of Japan. And so you see how the whole territory is gradually reshaped by this kind of uh, uh, principle that's, that uh, Tange was able to formalize in this amazing project for uh, Tokyo. But in, in this, let's say, evolution, you really see the problem of diagram. I mean, from an instrument to really somehow embrace the complexities that are beyond the phenomenology of architectural form, Diagram become a, a, a very totalizing moments of representation, which constantly somehow is reshaping reality even beyond the possibilities of reality itself, to the point that uh, diagrams are really becoming almost autonomous from actually what they are meant to uh, project and, uh, and represent. And of course, uh, here we are still in a moment where diagrams are devices, where diagrams are really uh, kind of proactive gestures that try to restructure the city. But today, uh, diagrams are icons. I mean, we, we, we produce diagrams not anymore as, as, as a kind of moment of, of understanding how reality itself can be forced and, and, and reinvented, but diagrams itself are just pure autonomous representation. For me, the most uh, interesting uh, moment is when we can say that, in a way, architectural form uh, is less and less important, but architectural thinking, I mean, this kind of nihilistic will to always reinvent the world beyond the possibility of the world itself and to consuming the world itself is really summarized in this statement by Colas, where he said, liberated from the obligation to construct, I mean, construct not to build, but construct, architecture can become a way of thinking about anything, a disciplines that represent the diagram of everything. Now, for me, this is really the moment where uh, 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 the diagram is really this, I mean, it's having its own kind of constitution, this kind of, uh, 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 let's say, possibility, but also danger to totally consume what is meant to represent, and therefore to be kind of a change ex nihilo, a change that doesn't have anymore the subject, the object that it wants to uh, change. But there is also another problem, how somehow this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, is uh, this kind of evolution of the diagram is reaching a kind of conclusion where more and more, uh, uh, let's say, reality, I mean, I, I, I use the word reality, which is, of course, a very tricky word in the w way Machiavelli was uh, defining reality as the effectual truth. I mean, the, 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 the how, how things are appearing, are, are how, how our feelings are, are somehow approaching what is around us. And actually, uh, this is really the moment where this moment of representation, I mean, how architecture can really somehow spread itself to this kind of value-free uh, becoming, where, where it's implicit this moment of nihilism, this moment of, of just consumption. So we constantly update our maps, we constantly update our representations, but this updating, this change, is constantly detaching, alienating itself in the Marxist sense of the word, alienating itself from the moment of uh, of, of friction between theory and, and reality, between projection and reality. And of course, this in a way creates a problem in, 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 in really in the core of what the diagram was meant to somehow um, uh, uh, provide, which is the moment of decision making, the moment of taking a decision, the moment to, to s represent, to legitimize uh, where the idea, where I mean, what, what actually change is meant to to, to, to say, I mean, how things can be, can be uh, project into something completely different. And actually, it's very interesting that uh, 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 diagrams more and more became almost uh, bounded diagrams. I mean, one of the things that I realized, especially working with my students, they didn't anymore represent the diagrams as a kind of just unique moment of representation of one option, of one possibilities. But they start to somehow uh, collect a series of diagrams and only through this kind of series of negotiation between different diagrams, you can somehow have a, a conclusion uh, about something which is always postponed by this kind of uh, sequence of diagrams. Now, the origin of this uh, idea of bounded diagrams, I mean, the fact that the project is deconstructed by this kind of endless series of, uh, of diagrams that never, let's say, focus the attention on one conclusive moment, a moment of hazardous, a moment of uh, form, is again coming from Wittkover. I mean, Wittkover, if you take his book, uh, he never shows the plan in one singular shot. He always 
make this kind of comparison, this, com this sort of uh, comparative analysis where what emerges is something that goes beyond architectural form. And this is kind of DNA, uh, kind of, let's say, invisible DNA that informs this intelligence but nevertheless is not actually representable through actually the empirical evidence of, uh, of form. And, and Bitcover is really insisting on this moment of, of transcending the singular uh, moment of, um, of form. And of course, Eisenman's uh, way of representing his project is very much going that direction. I mean, with Eisenman, you never have one drawing, one project, but you always have this kind of series of this evolution of, uh, of, uh, of uh, through bounded diagrams. Again, this attempt really to, to consume uh, the being of architecture, which is actually always embodied in form in this kind of uh, uh, almost nihilistic representation of, of, uh, of becoming, which doesn't start from somewhere, it doesn't end to, to some kind of clear uh, uh, conclusion. And of course, you can see also in more contemporary representations where like Alejandro Zaera, and you can almost have sort of continuity between Bitcover, Eisenman, Zairapal, although I mean the, the, the subject of the representation is completely different, nevertheless you always have this attempt to establish this intelligence, this form of intelligence that is transcending actually the empirical evidence of form that is almost consuming form in this kind of endless variations of uh, uh, form itself. What is interesting is that in a way this idea of, of let's say transcending, consuming the being of architecture is not something uh, that is only, let's say, uh, part of the, or let's say, a prerogative of the avant-garde itself. Even a, an architect like Aldo Rossi, who is also regarded as a kind of a background, if you want, of this, of this evolution, within the idea of typology was very much theorizing something that could be associated with the diagram. In Rossi, the idea of typology was not a fixed object, was not a fixed form but was the attempt to record a certain form of intelligence that was beyond form or models uh, in themselves. So for him, the evolution of the city could only be assessed by topology, namely something that was really beyond the substance of the city itself. In a way, I, I actually Rossi was very much influenced by the French school of urban geography, which was actually very influenced by Bergson. And Bergson, as, as you know, is a philosopher that really uh, uh, update uh, very much the definition of becoming with the idea of, of durée, the idea of, of something that really transcends the, the, what is, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, the division between time and space. And for Rossi, typology was really meant to represent this condition. It's very interesting that in his early drawing, we of course read the architecture of the city through its later projects. But uh, when he was writing the architecture of the city, he was making these kind of drawings, which were really, he was really attempting to, to represent this kind of intelligence that was transcending the evidence of form, of empirical form. So for me, this is actually really uh, what is uh, the power and the problem of the diagram. So on one hand, uh, the diagram is uh, somehow acknowledging a certain complexity that really goes beyond the uh, architectural form that really goes beyond something that is empirically there, but at the same time it is also is a, is a form of idealism that really project ourselves to something that is progressively alienated from, let's say, the problem of, our, of reality as reality appear to us. So in that sense, I think that uh, my idea of an after diagram is not, of course, the, the discards of diagrams, because this would just let's say, fuel this problem of stasis, the idea that we constantly change without really digesting things, without really to, to deeply theorize things, but we just, let's say, go to another chapter without really to absorb the structural background of this practice. But for me, the after diagram is precisely, to, as I said at the beginning, to be skeptical, to really see this as a semi-autonomous representations that while they are attempting to represent something that goes beyond actually reality as it appear to us, are also, let's say, arbitrary ideological uh, representations. The diagram cannot be seen only as a, as a given, almost a kind of natural, let's say, representation of something, but should always be a kind of moment, ideological moment, in which we really project, and therefore we reduce, we annihilate reality within, with, let's say, one idea, with one, uh, uh, let's say, uh, idea of the world and idea of the world that can even goes beyond what is almost, uh, let's say, neutralized 
as intelligence. And I think that uh, in that context, diagrams should, be, should almost be ideogram in a way that should always somehow not only uh, represent, but also establish an idea of the word in a deep meaning of, the, of, the, of their own, let's say, uh, uh, constituency, in, their own, in the deep meaning of their own, let's say, evolution. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pierre. Um, can we take some questions? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give people a couple of minutes while they warm up to the task. Um, Maybe just to pick up on one point, to try and connect the, the, the discourse on the diagram back to the question of, of urbanism and the realities of urban theory today. I, I, um, I, I'm struck with the shift towards an episteme and, and an epistemological project, um, even in the scientific sense, that, that there would be a will not for change for change's sake, but towards something, which I, I suppose would al could also be argued as a return to a kind of modern project which has and I guess the question would be a set of principles, goals, ambitions that are articulated in some way as foregrounding then the projects that come after. And I, I guess the question would then be what kind of, what's the basis for those principles or projects today and where might they lie beyond just the projects that people do within the city? Yeah. Well, I think, it's, I think you are right uh, in saying that the latent ambition of this critique is to reinforce the awareness that there is a need of going back, I, I don't like the word going back, <laughs> but to reappropriate a certain modern, if you want, attitude. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, to precise, that the, the, the word mod modernity, uh, modern, <coughs> comes from the Latin word modernus, which was uh, used for the first time in the fifth century BC to identify the early Christians. So in a way, the idea of modern, modernity, comes from this uh, etymological origin. And modernus means modus. Uh, modus, I mean, like modus operandi, a, a way of doing things. And, and uh, I mean, it was associated with the, with the early Christian because the early Christian were proactively choosing a totally different way of doing something. And therefore, they have this kind of, I mean, they, they were identified with this idea of modus. I mean, the choice of a totally different system of values through which to actually represent or believe uh, in the world. So the idea of, of modernity is really, if you want, this moment of dogmatic beginning, where you really, uh, um, do dogma means a doctrine without proof. So without a proof, you really decide to change and to assume a radically different position. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think that for me, uh, before to give a content to this attitude, we have to reconsider the attitude in itself. I mean, the, the modus, the way how theory, uh, it was produced uh, before. And actually, I see my critique on the diagram not as something, let's say, in order to get rid of diagrams, but almost as a thera therapeutic uh, attitudes to reinforce the fact that uh, uh, the diagram is sometimes an optical illusion where this moment, this hazardous of form, this hazardous of a choice, is always postponed and is always not really sharp in its own, even if you want, tragic, apocalyptic moment of choice. I'm, I'm thinking, in light of the argument you're making about Piranesi's version of Rome as a counter to Noles, that, that then what you seem to also then be offering are terms for for in fact categorizing diagrams in ways that are slightly unexpected. I'm thinking of work like ArcaZoom or SuperStudio, which provides diagrams of the modern city which are very different than the, than the kind of network bias of a Smithson project yeah. that in fact do to the modern city what Piranesi seems to be doing to Rome in a classical sense, starting from ground zero, the sort of tabula rasa of ArcaZoom slabs yeah. across the city that are anything but a kind of network, They're just yeah. a restarting. Yeah. I'm wondering if one of the possibilities then that you're opening up is the idea that diagrams suddenly can be differentiated from one another and not just a sort of generic term that applies across yes. entire generations of work. Yeah, of course. Uh, there are, let's say, well, for me, 
I think you, you pick up very good examples because uh, um, ArchidZoom, Nostop City share the same, let's say, uh, let's say, mm, approach to Piranesi. I mean, they represent mm. the project only with yeah. one, let's say, drawing. Of course, these drawings are always different, but they are not, let's say, idealization of yeah, yeah. Uh, of yeah. the of the thing itself. But it's really the thing itself in its own literal. Almost, uh, uh, in fact, I mean, when I mean, also that the drawing have a certain aggressive, almost uh, uh, attitude toward us. I mean, it's not postponing that the moment where the city is reduced to this kind of, uh, you know, absolute uh, tabula, yeah. tabula rasa. So, in that sense, I think that for me, both uh, Piranesi's uh, Campo Marzio and Archizum Nostop Cities are not really what today we can consider diagrams. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't; they are not creating that kind of intelligence through the, let's say, the, the recording of the becoming of, of the plan itself. There are only one drawing. Mm. I mean, I always actually shows uh, this early sketch of, uh, of Branzi, of not subsidy to my students who say, you know, he, he just make this project with one plan. I mean, yeah. you, you, uh, like, you know, like the Campo Marzo is only one plan. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, you know, this endless repeat diagrams that we, through which we construct our research. There is only one drawing. And that's for me very interesting. That's, I would say, is really the modern approach. Mm. That with one, let's say, clear direction, you are able to put forward an idea. And, but in, and at the same time, you're aware that that kind of moment of conjecture will never cover the entire possibilities of, uh, of the city. I mean, in that sense, you are aware that you are really putting yourself in a very partial and very, let's say, singular uh, position. Well, this is very different how, for example, Colas or Doxiadis are using diagrams, where they really try to represent everything. I mean, they really try to somehow embrace, in a kind of Hegelian way, the whole totality of the world. Questions? Um, I, I enjoy the lecture very much, and I particularly enjoyed the way you, in a sense, quite carefully tiptoed around the issue of the concept drawing and the way in which the concept drawing shares a certain territory with the diagram in terms of staging an epistemy, which the kind of FOA's use of the phylogenesis is yeah. just, in a sense, repeating. And, and so I'm kind of, you know, want to know why, why that? And um, to what extent do you see the the latter-day diagram, Rose diagram, in its just as simply as a reincarnation of the concept drawing of earlier moments of modernism? I think uh, that, uh, um, that, that that kind of continuity is really in what I identify with the problem of, of nihilism. I mean, for me, uh, I mean, I have problems with this concept because the first time I try to argue uh, this kind of that the, the essence of the diagram is, is, is basically the essence of nihilism. I mean, a lot of people are really reacting in a very negative way. Let's say, oh, this is really, you know, it's not really a nice way to approach the problem. But for me, uh, nihilism is something very st structural. I mean, it's, it's something that really, I mean, without nihilism, we would not have history. I mean, and, and actually, this is also the, the reason why uh, Western thought, uh, if you want, uh, I'm going to say something very politically incorrect, almost won over other culture. I mean, Clement Greenberg once w was say that, that in fact, in, in instead of talking about globalization, we should talk about the Westernization of the, of the whole world. And the reason why I'm insisting in this continuity, in this kind of repetition of the early, I mean, instead of, in, instead of looking to what the diagrams are representing that always change, I'm trying to see the structural condition through, the through which the diagrams are produced in order to really identify this line of continuity, which for me never, let's say, change from the early example of, of, of let's say, uh, diagrams to actually Alejandro or Greg Lynn, uh, let's say, use of diagrams. Is this moment of... Uh, idealization of the world, where you acknowledge both the, the complexity of the world and you consume the world through these kind of very simple, direct uh, representations. And this, for me, really the essence, I would say, of, of, of Western thought, of the historicity of Western thought, I mean, of, of metaphysics. 
I mean, this is actually, if you want uh, uh, really something I can't really articulate myself. I mean, something that really goes beyond my knowledge and my competence as an architect. But I believe that there is a continuity that we have to address uh, and even beyond, let's say, the, the specific uh, understanding of diagrams within architectural culture. I don't know if I answered to your question or... I mean, to some extent you did. <laughs> I th I, I'm, in, in the light of what you just said, I, I would kind of put forward the idea that actually these diagrams are the currency of the construction of that culture. Yes. It's more important to these architects to Absolutely. produce the diagrams Absolutely. than it is to produce the buildings. Uh, and in that way, they are highly rhetorized, yeah. partly fictitious events always. Absolutely, Absolutely. But there is one, I mean... When I start my PhD, I mean, my PhD was, uh, is about a, a crazy idea which I call the possibility of an absolute architecture. I mean, and I start the PhD really trying to say, I really want to go back to architectural form, I mean, as form objects, and to get rid of this kind of virtualization of, uh, of form, this kind of diagrammatic representation. And towards the end of my thesis, I realized that my first hypothesis was extremely naive, in a way. Why? Because Architecture, I mean, first of all, there is a difference between building and architecture. Architecture as such is something that starts, let's say, at the end of 15th century, beginning of 16th century, in the moment where we start to have authorship for architecture. I mean, before, for example, Gothic architecture, we don't have authorship. We don't have a singular architect build. I mean, we don't have the author of buildings. It's from the 15th century on that we have singular author that are you know, manifesting their own personality, with their own style, their own manner with uh, a building. And it's very interesting that the moment this fi figure emerged, I mean, Anthony Bland described this in, in his own uh, uh, book, which I don't remember the title, this book, uh, Theory in Renaissance, something like that. Uh, this coincides with the, the beginning of the age of printing. And in fact, I, at the beginning of my thesis, I thought that the absolute of architecture was formed but in fact, the absolute of architecture is the book. It's actually representation. I mean, all great architects from Palladio to Colas, they are important because the book. So the moment of representation, I mean, the moment of the, of the abstraction of architecture to representation is really actually what characterizes architecture. So that's why I said before we have a paradox that on one hand, architectural form is less and less important. But the architectural way of thinking of abstracting reality is more and more important. The problem is that this kind of uh, what Marx would call real abstraction that we are producing through architecture for me is becoming too problematic because actually the intelligence of diagrams, they don't have any more the friction of architecture of as, as, as matter. I mean, and to me, theory, I mean, architecture, the real architectural theory always comes from the conflict between let's say, empirical, the effectual truth and the imagination of things. And this is actually what today, contemporary diagrams are totally missing. I mean, they are pure imagination. I mean, in a way, they are the realization of the 68 power to imagination. I enjoyed it also very much. And one of the things that I enjoyed most about uh, what you've done is to open up so many potential events for us to think about. And uh, I, I'm, I'm struck, in fact, by the extent to which your talk is almost populated by events. Uh, now, in that sense, then, it became curious for me because there, there are a couple of books that come close to touching on the, the, the topic you've dealt with where, in a way, you almost, it's almost like you sidestepped these, uh, these other events. So I just wanted to ask you about them a little bit. Like, for example, I mean, you know, it seems that in a way, if we if we string along some of your, of your events, we've we've got the the Noli Piranesi event, and it's an interesting dialogue. And all of your events are structured around these this kind of dialogue or dispute yes. about what you can achieve by working through the diagram. And starting in a way in a similar way, Francois Chouai sort of starts with with the same time period and then says it breaks down until we get urbanism in the 1860s. Yeah. And then Hyung Moon Pai sort of says, well, we, we don't really have the diagram. We have something 
else. We have form and representation until we start to lose confidence in its ability to represent human order for us in a way. And so then with Ackerman and Mumford and others, then we get the, the diagram in, in the 20th century. In a way, you, d you don't follow either Shawai or Hyungman Pai, but instead see a series of other dialogues. Was that a, a kind of conscious choice yeah. not to engage with them? Yeah, actually, uh, it's very as I said at the beginning of the lecture, this was a very idiosyncratic personal presentation because in a way it, 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 it's really coming from my own, ba I, I graduated in urbanism. I, 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 not, I didn't graduate as, as, really as, as an architect, but really as an urban planner. And I also did my first doctorate in planning. And my dissatisfaction with the with urbanism was coming from the fact that, uh, well, urbanists and planners hate architects. Uh, Francois Choez is a very good example of yeah. that. I like her a lot. I mean, she's a great person, but she really hates architects. Now, I realize myself, uh, and actually uh, planners, I mean urbanists, they are always claiming that, you know, uh, we can only talk about urbanists from 18th, uh, let's say, half of 18th century on, before there is not such a thing like urbanism. Nevertheless, my idea, <coughs> coming actually from a, a, a planning background, is that often the imagination of the city itself is not produced by planning and urbanism, which really remain often a diagram or something very upset, but is really produced by architectural image. Somehow, some, sometimes architecture is able to put forward, because it's empirically evident, our own cognition of the city itself. And that's why I was trying to uh, show this in the lecture the, emer the emergence of this cognition of the city, but how architects somehow started to realize that. And for me, the, the dispute between Piranesi and, and Nolli, which is a dispute between, a, 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 let's say, a, 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 not an architect, a scientist of measures uh, and, and an architect, is really the prototypical moments where this conflict between these two different way of representing the city is emerging. And I really try to argue that, of course, uh, less and less, more and more architecture was less important. Nevertheless, these kind of representations like Nolli Map or Campo Marzio are very important for us to understand anyway how the, the, the meaning of the city uh, evolved. So in that sense, I was trying to react against my own background, which was very much of, uh, of let's say, uh, skepticism towards, towards architectural representation. But I realize that more and more, especially today, that architectural representation is very much <laughs> contributing to our understanding of the city. Thanks, any, any more, maybe time for one more question? Does anybody have? Then we'll stop there. Pierre Vittorio, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. thanks.